I honestly didn't think my when I was your age stories would be about the rights we used to have. But, you know, I was naively optimistic enough to think that this country couldn't possibly elect Donald Trump its president all the way up until election night. So what the fuck do I know? You know, look, Trump is not going to have much of a legacy. As unbreakable as his hold on the Republican Party seems now, it'll disintegrate the instant he's out of power. They'll start trying to sanitize him from the party's memory that second, if not before. The overwhelming majority of his reforms are going to be rescinded. Virtually all of his executive orders are going to be nullified. His pathetic little wall will be torn down and thrown into the Rio Grande if it hasn't managed to fall in there of its own accord before we can get to it. Some of the shit will linger, certainly. Right. I doubt we'll raise taxes to where they were before he took office. We probably won't reinstate every single one of the environmental regulations they eviscerated. But, you know, we're going to rejoin the WHO. We'll re-sign the Paris Climate Accord. We'll salvage the Iran nuclear deal if we can. That kind of shit can more or less be repaired. But if the courts ever recover, I will not live to see it. Odds are you won't either. You will never again live in an America with as much freedom as it had when you were born. And if you're one of our non-U.S. listeners, you can take some comfort in that, but you'll never live in a world with as much freedom. So it's not like the blanket's all the way dry for you either. John Roberts and his court of theocratic partisans have been given way too much credit for the few bones they've thrown to minorities. Right. Like, don't get me wrong. I I don't want to minimize the truly historic gains the LGBTQ community has won under the Roberts court. But the court doesn't deserve a hell of a lot of credit. You know, the activists that spent the last several decades educating the rest of us put the court in a position where it almost couldn't help but affirm those hard earned rights. I mean, consider the recent decision that infuriated so many Christians about LGBTQ employment rights. Like this decision makes it illegal for employers to fire somebody for being gay or trans. And that's awesome. Right. That is a long overdue right. But it's also a right that already existed for most Americans. Even before that decision, most people lived in states that protected gay people from employment discrimination. And the overwhelming majority of national chains and national brands had at least policies in place against it and for nothing but PR purposes. So, yes, it still matters that the SCOTUS affirms it and that the rest of the country gets it. It is still historic, but it was also culturally inevitable. And it was inevitable because of the work of activism and education. Right. Like I'd have ventured to say that most Americans probably thought it already was illegal to fire somebody for being gay. And and let's not lose sight of the fact that even in that decision, Gorsuch planted a poison pill that all but guaranteed exemptions for religious employers. At the same time, they were affirming that right. They were undermining it. Hell, one might even say that that was the chief effect of this decision. Right. But even if I'm being overly critical here and they deserve a goddamn parade for that one, it is still overshadowed by virtually every other decision they've made since Gorsuch joined the fucking court. The relentless effort to expand the definition of religious freedom to include things like denying the freedom of others has been and will remain the chief contribution of Robert's court to American law. This ridiculous hyperinflation that has made second class citizens out of not only non-Christians, but any minority that Christians deign to disfavor is what this court has given us or rather what it has taken away from us. Right. The most recent middle finger to secular government was an expansion of the ministerial exception. That's the legal doctrine first codified by John Roberts Court in 2012 in a decision he wrote the majority opinion on that exempts churches from anti-discrimination laws when they hire ministers. It's why, for example, a woman can't sue the Catholic Church for refusing to hire her for a priest position just because she's a woman. But when they conjured up this bullshit exemption, they declined to actually define minister. Right. Clarence Thomas's dumbass argued that the court should, quote, defer to a religious organization's good faith understanding, end quote. Of course, like every other group ever trusted by the government to police itself, churches did not apply a rigid definition here and ultimately expanded out the definition of minister to any position they cared to discriminate in. Right. And and I'd love to use that as evidence, by the way, that the SCOTUS fucked this all up in the first place. But this week they were faced with that fact, you know, the churches had obviously used this exception for positions that no reasonable person could define as minister. And they doubled right the fuck down on it. According to Alito, it's up to churches to, quote, decide for themselves, free from state interference, matters of church government, as well as those of faith and doctrine, end quote. In other words, and this is not remotely hyperbolic, 
Employment laws should not apply to religious institutions. That's what the fucking words he wrote meant. And if you think, by the way, that this is somehow going to be limited to churches, I should point out that the cases before the court that prompted this decision were not from fucking churches. They were from religious schools. And as we've learned over the last few years, a goddamn theme park can be a ministry if it means they don't have to hire gay people. Hell, if a craft store can be a religious employer for the purposes of denying contraceptive coverage, what principle is there to stop Hobby Lobby from calling all their cashiers ministers? Right, sure, that sounds ridiculous, but no more ridiculous than it would have sounded 10 years ago to say Hobby Lobby was a religious corporation. It's time we stop talking about repairing the wall of separation. Right, at this point, we're paying the salaries of clergy out of the public coffers. There's a separate set of fucking laws for religious and non-religious people. There is no wall left to repair. If there ever is one again, it's going to be because we built a new one from scratch.